Thank you, Ana Maria. It's my pleasure and privilege to be here. And I would like really to thank you, Ana Maria, for organizing this meeting. I'm really happy to see this room so crowded, which means that probably what Ana Maria has been doing in the past six years and what I should be doing in the, uh, hopefully in the next six years, it's really worthwhile uh, continuing. <clears throat> uh, I would like also to thank you, Ana Maria, for giving such a brilliant uh, outsight of the, the problem of hemolysis in clinical laboratories. And I will focus the rest of my presentation on the way of identifying hemolyzed specimen and on managing hemolyzed specimen. Uh, you are, I'm sorry, you're probably familiar with this photo. I understand that this photo is pretty familiar also on the web. This is my blood, so I should probably have made some kind of copyright with, with these photos because I did it more than 10 years ago and give you, uh, gives you a quite clear uh, representation of what means uh, receiving an MLA specimen. From, this is my blood completely clear. As you can understand easily, I have a Gilbert disease. I'm not really ill. I have a, a high bilirubin, a congenital high bilirubin. But as long as we have introduced uh, emolized blood uh, uh, within the, the sample, you can see that the, the sample turns uh, the color. And it actually uh, starts from a yellow, uh, or uh, more, even more transparent, depending on the concentration of bilirubin, up to dark, uh, dark brown or dark red. And uh, this is pretty easy to understand visually. But as Anna Maria uh, uh, has already highlighted, it's not so easy to understand whether receiving one sample. I'll, I'll just make you a, a clear example. If you receive this sample and you don't have any kind of benchmark to understand whether this is uh, a sample with increased uh, hemoglobin inside or it's a normal sample, it's very difficult to take a clinical decision on it because you can, or many of us could actually rank this sample as non-hemolyzed, others could, could rank this sample as mildly hemolyzed, others could rank the sample as significantly hemolyzed, or many others would say, I have no idea, because I don't have any benchmark to understand whether the sample is uh, hemolyzed or not. Anna Maria has already shown this, uh, uh, this picture. It's extremely important to, to understand that if we rely on <clears throat> Only visual inspection of the sample, we, we can take up to one third of the of wrong medical decisions. And why this happens? It happens basically because there are main uh, four main factors that influence our capability to recognize the color and to rank the color according to a scale. And this depends on the genetics of our eyes, on the anatomy of our, our eyes, if we have some kind of disease, for instance, if we don't recognize the color, or even by the environment, which means the light exposure of our room and etc. Uh, the, the, the availability of having sun or artificial light and acceptor. This would actually, all these factors would, would actually influence our definitive capability of uh, um, understanding whether the sample is emolized or not. What should we do according to the guidelines? We know these guidelines have been published many years ago, nearly 10 years ago, and we still know that the hemoglobin chanide method, what we call the Drabkin method, is still the reference essay for measuring hemoglobin. But the Drabkin method as a kind of a problem. First, it was uh, originally developed with chanide, and we cannot, uh, at least in many European countries, I guess in almost uh, each European country, we cannot have any longer chanide in our laboratories. So uh, we have a, 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 a kind of different approach without chanide, but we measure the same thing. But the, the real problem is that it, it is not convenient to use this method in clinical laboratories for many safety, and also for many practical reasons, like the fact that it is mostly a manual essay, it has a long turnaround time, high imprecision, and indeed uh, also an incremental cost. So what we are doing now, uh, the opportunity that we have now is to replace this reference technique with the surrogate method, which is measuring what we call the HIL or serum indices in our samples. The principle is quite easy uh, and straightforward. Professor Simungis gave you already some clue about uh, the, the, the basic reasoning underneath this approach. All the different interfering substances, which are basically turbidity as a reflection of lipemia, hemoglobin as a reflection of hemolysis, and bilirubin as a reflection of icterus, have different absorbance within serum on plasma. So based on their property of a we can develop uh, some spectrophotometric measures that would uh, actually help us to uh, overcome the problem of the visual assessment and obtain some kind of, uh, let's say, uh, no, no longer arbitrary but objective measure uh, 
this translates actually into a value of interference into and within our sample. This is what uh, our analyzer actually do. They perform this lecture uh, within the, the serum of the plasma. And uh, for uh, some um, different algorithms, which are basically instrument and uh, um, manufacturer dependent, they rank the result according to the fact that the result has no interference or the result has some kind of interference. I will show you then in the next part of my presentation how critical is this approach used by the different company. But other, in other way, uh, the final data that we had is, is a, a, a result that can be flagged or not according to instrument specific algorithms that have been developed by the companies. Uh, this is the main issue. Uh, as you will see, we have published this paper some years ago, uh, actually last year, and we have uh, uh, performed a kind of a survey of all the different diagnostic companies to understand whether uh, and how the different companies were uh, actually assessing the, the um, HIL indices. And it is already clear from this picture how heterogeneous is the approach of the different companies, because the companies are using different wavelengths, different combinations of wavelengths and different algorithms for subtra subtracting one wavelength to the other. So already the result provided by, by one company is not completely harmonized or standardized with the result provided by another company. And the main difference concern are the sensitivity to detect interfering substances, the linearity and the measurement range, the decision uh, cutoffs for suppressing the data, specification for allowable bias, sample volume used for analysis, type of buffer used for diluting sample and measuring the indices, the wavelengths at which the sample absorbance is read, the algorithms for defining the volume and correcting for spectral interference, and the reporting system, which is extremely heterogeneous across the different manufacturers in terms of quality or quantitative scale, or also on the measuring units, because some analyzer report the uh, HIL index in concentration of hemoglobin, of bilirubin, or lipids. Other uh, analyzer are reporting the interference in terms of arbitrary units. But even though we could be able to overcome all these critical issues, still we will have some important drawbacks, such as the measurement procedure, the approach for reporting interference data, the definition of objective thresholds of interference, and the lack of harmonized practices for identification of interference cutoffs. Some issues that have been debated over the past decades and that have somehow slowed uh, the introduction of the use of the HIL indexes in the uh, clinical laboratories. These are mostly driven by the perception that if I'm using the HIL uh, index, then I will increase my rejection rate. Of course, I will increase the, my rejection rate, but this concern is not justified because I'm simply having a high degree of quality in my laboratory. So if I reject a sample with a bias inside, I'm doing the right thing to do on that specimen. The poor harmonization of the techniques, yes, indeed. This is, of course, a justified concern. No standardization of the measured units, of course. Heterogeneity of instrument specific cutoff, yes, of course, this is a concern. Impact on laboratory efficiency, impact on laboratory economics, the lack of reliable quality control system will be the part, the next part of my presentation. So the first thing to demonstrate and most of us are somehow concerned that if I start to measure HIL indices on all my sample, I will increase my turnaround time. This is not true. We published this study some years ago and we demonstrated that actually the turnaround time of using or not the HIL index as a routine part of our daily testing does not impact the routine. There is also only one instrument which increases the turnaround time by 5%, but for other instruments, for instance, the use of the HIL index paradoxically ameliorate all the process of sample management within the analyzer. So the fact that uh, the, the perception that using HIL index is a problem for the turnaround time is absolutely not justified. Even the quality specification of the HIL index are extremely extremely consistent uh, across the many analyzes that we have. Uh, for instance, this is, I, I just take this example as paradigmatic. This is the um, um, pre-analytical uh, quality assurance of a coagulation analyzer. As you know, the hemolysis, uh, uh, the um, HIL indices have been originally developed for clinical chemistry, and then they have been moved to immunochemistry and hemostasis. And this hemolysis index, this um, HIL index developed on a coagulation 
Presentation Instrumentation, as you can see, have a really outstanding quality performance. We did the same on Clinical Chemistry Analyzer, and for instance, as you can see, the H index has a mean overall imprecision, which includes all, uh, both the inter-essay uh, inter imprecision of 1.6%, which is threefold lower than the um, performance goal that we have set for this measure. More or less, the other indices have the same, uh, um, the same good performance, and in all cases, they are threefold lower than the quality specification that we are using. Another good point on the, the HIL indices is that they are fairly stable, except for the uh, lipemic index, which already after one, e uh, one hour of storage tend to gradually increase, but as you can see, the H index and the E index, the ICTERI index, are fairly stable up to two hours within the same specimen. So we can centrifuge the specimen and then keep the specimen there up to two hours without any fear that something will happen on, uh, um, on these measures. Um, the second part of the presentation is the uh, management of uh, um, emolized specimen. There has been a debate on going for the past two, three years about what shall we do with a uh some kind of bias due to hemolysis in our sample. And there were actually two main approaches uh, on to handle this, this problem. And I, I would say that these approaches were really radical because in uh, a certain way, some uh, scientists were saying, okay, uh, releasing the data is even more important than suppressing the data for reason of patient safety. So whatever uh, the result, whenever the result is biased, we still have to give that data to the clinician and telling them, okay, this is the result, but be careful because the result is somehow biased by the presence of hemolysis. But others have suggested another approach, even uh, more radical. Whenever the sample has a kind of a bias due to hemolysis, the sample, the test must be suppressed and the specimen must be rejected. So we would need another sample in replacement of the other sample. As always in life, I mean, I'm Italian, of course, I'm, uh, I'm a democratic Italian, so we can uh, actually find out a, uh, some, some point of uh, um, common between these two positions. And, uh, uh, more or less the, the truth is always in between two radical positions. So what we did actually is to merge all our brain together and we have developed these guidelines, this recommendation, which uh, are a kind of a combination of the two approaches. And um, um, just to give you some advice, what we uh, actually thought thought that the, the best way to handle the um, hemolysis in our laboratory is that test result measured in sample where the H index values are associated with the bias ranging between the analytically and the clinical significant cutoff should be reported because in such way you won't have any kind of cleaning clinical um, consequences of your patient. Results of hemolysis sensitive tests measure in sample when the H index values are associated with a bias exceeding the clinical significant cutoff, which is more, more or less the reference change values, then, then that result should be suppressed. Because whenever we know that the bias is higher than the clinical importance, the clinical uh, significance of the results, we can probably derange the clinical decision making and jeopardize patient safety. And we actually introduced another point um, uh, around the fact that when the, the uh, concentration of cell-free hemoglobin and the hemolysis is too high within the specimen, up to 10 gram, um, 10 gram liter, we don't have evidence that this bias can be managed in some way. So what we did is to suggest that whenever uh, the concentration of cell-free hemoglobin is over this threshold, over this cutoff, the sample should actually be rejected because we, do, we don't have any evidence that uh, dealing in one way or in, uh, um, in the other would actually influence patient management. Um, what I've already tell you, uh, told you is clearly represented by this figure. Uh, and this square uh, de designates uh, actually the different uh, areas of results that can be managed differently. So as I said before, within the bias is only comprised between the analytically or the clinically significant cutoff, we can release the results. Whenever the results uh, has exceed the clinical cutoff, uh, which means whenever the bias is over the reference change values, then we can we are not allowed to release that results. And whenever the bias is over 10 gram liters, whatever the test has been ordered on that sample, we have no evidence to say that we can safely manage that specimen. So we can actually, we must actually ask for another samples. 
What about the quality assessment of uh, HIL index? Um, this foremost paper published by Mario Plebani uh, two years ago uh, actually concluded that the need to control and improve quality in clinical laboratories has grown and in end with the growth in technical developments leading to an impressive reduction of analytical errors over time. An essential cause of this impressive involvement has been the introduction of quality control. What we have discussed uh, during the past, the past years in the working group is that what we consider is that the uh, HIL index must be treated exactly as whatever as other laboratory tests. So whatever we do with bilirubin, troponin, um, calcium, uh, potassium, etc., must also be done for the hemolysis index, for, sorry, for the HIL index. So if we are using quality controls for checking the um, reliability of all our data, we should, use also, we should also use uh, um, quality control for managing the HIL index. And we published also this paper uh, to provide some technical um, insights on how uh, the quality management, the, the use of quality control for the HIL index can be done in clinical laboratories. And more or less, we gave some indication on how uh, we should select the quality control material, how this material can be prepared. The article is freely available on the FLM website, so I, I have no time enough to, to describe all, all the single points, but you, if you are interested, you can download it from the FLM website. Then we gave some indication on how the quality control can be stored, stored and used, how the uh, quality control should be um, daily assessed, which are the performance goal of the quality controls, how can we manage the um, unacceptable data of quality controls, and at the end, uh, we also gave some update on uh, some recommendation on how to handle the um, commercially available material. Then we, what we decided that sometimes uh, uh, you start from the theory, but you, so, you also must verify what you have theorized into practice. So we, uh, what we wanted to do is to verify whether uh, uh, what we have written in our document, uh, the theory that we have written in our document about quality management, would also be feasible in the real, um, uh, in the real world scenario. So uh, first of all, we evaluated the use of commercial quality controls uh, over the day, and as you can see, uh, the performance of this commercial quality control is absolutely suitable with our daily activity, but then we also decided to um, product some kind of internal quality controls for reason of uh, um, for economical reason because in such a way you don't have to um, to buy the quality controls from external sources and you can have, you can develop your internal quality controls according to your local practice and we tested these quality controls and uh, when when we started to um, to run this experiment we soon realized that the quality controls that we used on fresh material had the bias on the L index the H index and the icteric index were uh, performing quite well, but the L index, as you will see, on the day afterward, the, the first measurement of the value on the fresh material had a substantial bias. So we decided that probably the best approach for using uh, internal quality control is that to develop, uh, to, is that to produce this quality control, to froze them, and then to measure the, uh, the performance specification and the target value of the quality control on the frozen material. And in this, uh, using this approach, as you will see, the use of this in-house prepared quality, quality control material is perfectly suitable for our um, routine daily activity. It's also suitable for um, performing an external quality assessment because you can manage this sample, you can produce this sample, and you can, if you have a network of laboratories, you can ship these samples to the uh, other laboratories in, in your network. Uh, I would conclude with uh, uh, a last consideration about the, the use of the HIL index, and especially of the hemolysis index. Uh, we published this paper last year, and as you will see, we compare, we actually compare the hemolysis index with the reference measure for uh, hemoglobin, which is more or less, in all this study, was Chan meta hemoglobin assay or spectrophotometric assessment, and there is a very, a fairly high uh, correlation between the hemolysis index um, with the reference technique. This means that probably uh, it needs to be validated, but probably this approach, the hemolysis index, can also be used for intravascular hemolysis for monitoring or diagnosis patient with intravascular hemolysis. Thank you.